Hello, and welcome to Managing Anxiety at Work for NHS Frontline Staff. We at SBK Healthcare would like to say how proud we are to have produced this event, and we hope that you find it useful. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Mike Scanlon. He's a mental health consultant at Mind Time Therapies. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. So, what I've tried to do today is to, I've completely rewritten, I do quite a lot of um, work managing anxiety at work, but I've completely rewritten and produced some new sort of materials because I think this is just unlike any other time, isn't it? For, and especially for, for, for those of you who are at the moment right on that front line, as we call it, um, engaging with all of the difficulty, all of the stress, all of the anxiety, the tragedy, the um, camaraderie, the um, gleaning of new knowledge and experience. You know, the yin yang comes with the yang, doesn't it? But I think overall, it's a terribly, terribly anxious time. And the great Seligman once said that all anxiety is predicated upon a loss of control and a sense of uncertainty. Now, I'm not sure about the complete loss of control, but certainly we're living in times of great uncertainty. And there must be uncertainty every day for those people going to work directly and indirectly with this stuff. And today I was working back in, I'm back in the NHS, and today I was working um, back in the NHS this morning and um, seeing people and with a sense of the um, uncertainty that I was feeling. So it kind of helped tonight. So I'm going to try and make this as useful as possible. The stance I'm taking um, is not cognitive behavioral therapy as you might know it, although that's where the evidence base lies if you were doing a piece of anxiety management therapy. I've moved today towards something I think might work well in these times because I think that to come through as unscathed as possible through this whole very difficult time, we have to take a stance, a psychological stance that allows us to be compassionate towards ourselves and others, that allows us to be mindful and helps us not to move into a sort of automatic pilot setting where we just sort of blur our way through these difficult days, losing sight of the stuff that really matters. And so our stance that we're taking tonight is one of third wave cognitive behavioral therapy, which means that we are of course using that um, importance of thoughts and feelings and emotions, but we're also um, in involving a real sense of um, compassion for ourselves and for others, as I said, but also that ability to step back a little bit and find space and use that to help us get through this stuff. So let's just have a quick think because, you know, we ask the question, is it possible to maintain a sense of well-being? And during times like these and i think i think it is possible you know i think it is um but this definition here says it all by hooper doesn't it and i love this bit here that it actually includes the accepting the experience of negative emotions and managing them successfully so we can i still think find that combination of feeling good and functioning effectively amidst everything that is happening. But to do that, we do have to kind of experience and manage negative, difficult, scary emotion. And that's why I think that particular definition really fits. Do you know, I've been doing that all week, that sort of um, double press, forgive me. So we have to think, I think, think I think, about this issue of reactivity to stress. And what we mean by that is when stress shows up, what are we doing with it, you know? And I'll come to the great Viktor Frankl um, again, although I, 
I did notice on YouTube this week that um, the whole of his book has an audio recording. Um, Man's Search for Meaning is currently free on um, YouTube. Uh, and anyone wants a really good read to help you through difficult times, it's a great book. And Frankel came up with this wonderful quote from the book. And what he came up with is that when we're no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I think that that's where we sit at the moment, isn't it? Because we're in very uncharted waters. And the metaphor I quite like is that sense of being on a ship in a very stormy sea without a compass. And what we need to find is our compass. And I think what I'm trying to help us with tonight is to look and find a compass that might take us through this. Because the three common ways to respond, backtrack, to react to stress is these. So, and none of them work terribly well in, in the long term. They might work okay in the short term, but they don't work well in the long term. So I'd like you guys just to have a think about which one is the one that you possibly have been connecting to and channeling just recently. And, you know, if it works for you, you keep on. Evidence of my experience over many, many years in this profession tell me that it doesn't really work. So if we react to, it, to stressful situation with a sort of indifference, you know, don't bother me, don't bother me. I don't think it works at all because what we're sort of doing with that vein of indifference and that pretending that actually we're made of Teflon, you know, and nothing gets through to me, is a very short-termist way of dealing with this. Because we're back to my stress metaphor that those of you who've done any work with me before will know it's my absolute fave, which is that one of the beach ball again. And if we try and meet stress with indifference, it's almost as if we go, don't bother me, don't bother me. But surreptitiously, we're kind of pushing the beach ball of stress under the water so that we can maintain our lovely view of the beach and the scenery. Now, the problem with that is that that indifference and that pushing the beach ball under takes effort, doesn't it? And after a while, we begin to get tired holding that beach ball under and maintaining that sense of indifference. And actually, people around us don't respond well to that indifference. And we're not helping others who are struggling with stress and anxiety by feigning a sort of indifference that says, I'm okay and you're not. And after a while, that beach ball, boof, it bursts up. And we move from indifference into panic, or we move from indifference into a sort of breakdown scenario. Indifference doesn't work. Nor does that sort of attaching to the stress and clinging to it and sort of holding on to it and using what we call the manic defense. So the manic defense, and this is an absolute fave of health workers, whether we're on the front line during this or not. I've seen so many health workers respond or react with the manic defense, which is this. Things are really busy. They're really, really hectic. They're terribly stressful. So my way of dealing with this is to attach to it and to desperately try to do more and more and more, to get in early to work, to stay longer, not to take my breaks, but to work like a Trojan, never stopping, indifferent to my own needs. Because if I can get on top of this, if I can get right on top of this, I'll, I'll start to feel safe. We never get on top of this, you know, this is too big. And the manic defense doesn't work because after a while, that defending our psyche through this doing more and more and more 
well, frankly, it knackers us. We become very tired. And as we become tired, we become frazzled. As we become frazzled, we stop sleeping. As we stop sleeping, we get up even earlier. We do even more. And the third one also doesn't work. Is I can't have this. You know, I'm just not going to think about it. I'm going to block everything out. I'm going to use multitude of distraction techniques. I'm going to try and be on automatic pilot all day long and just, just go. That, in effect, is another pushing the beach ball under. So what we've got to do is we've got to look at this, as Frankel says, and if we're adopting some of these strategies, the challenge we give ourselves is, well, let's work with Mike tonight and let's actually change some of our responses to this anxiety, to this stress, to this difficulty. So let's just see if we can just use a stance of mindfulness of what really matters. Let me just move me. So if we look at this slide here, guys, and we look at this and it asks us how important does each area feel to you? I'm just going to spend five minutes on this on this slide. And this is one to be doing again. And I am going to send out um, a tool I use, which is called a life balance tool. And um, you may want to do this in the quiet of your own homes at some point, but let me just take you through it. So I'm going to do it for myself. But as I'm doing it, just score yourselves too. So how important is my extended family, the first one? You know, just how important does it feel to me right now? Well, a bit more than it was a few weeks ago, to be honest, but where 10 is very important and one is not, they're about a four. How important is Mrs. Scanlon, um, my wife? She's about a nine. How important are my kids? Yeah, they feel about 10. My friends, eight. My work, about an eight. Learning new skills, about an eight. Just having fun, about an eight. Spirituality and meaning and purpose is up there as a nine, I think. Citizenship, community life is higher than it's ever been, at a four. My health, my physical health is really important at the moment. It's up at the moment. That's about an, an eight or a nine. Social media um, is about a one. And um, underneath this, the slide hasn't quite shown you all. It says pets. And Billy the Mindful Dog, my pointer, he's a nine. He's an 8.7. My wife was a nine, wasn't she? So when I score that and I get in touch, Basically, what we know is the higher the score probably indicates that's where I indicates what really matters to me. And I would say, actually, that's pretty true. So let's move on. So how much time, effort and headspace then are me and you, are me and you giving to each one of these different areas amidst this really difficult time? And this is where this tool becomes so important because what sustains us as human beings and what allows us to kind of um, diffuse and mop up some of that intolerable feelings of anxiety is living our lives in touch with what really matters, even amidst the difficulty that is here. Because if living with this really difficult anxiety provoking time means that all we focus on is work. All we focus on is problematic. All we focus on causes us to feel anxious and stressed. Well, we've moved away from living a life in touch with our values. So, and I'm, I'm a, absolutely there with that, you know, because when I look at this and I have a look, um, my extended family, I'm absolutely in balance there. They're about a four in importance and they're getting about a four in terms of my time, effort, and headspace. I'm absolutely in balance at the moment. 
with Mrs. Scanlon, you know, we're kind of teeming through this difficult time. Um, my kids I'm in balance with, absolutely. But when I get to friends, do you know, I said they were an eight, didn't I? I wonder where you are with this. But the time, effort and headspace I've been actually giving them during this period has been about a two. And that doesn't mean that I have to be thinking about them, talking to them, Zooming them, Skyping them, chatting, texting, whatever media we use. It doesn't mean I have to be doing it all the time, but at eight and a two. And then I asked myself a question. Do you know, if I just started connecting with friends a bit more, would that help me with some of this anxiety? And the answer, friends, is yes. Mm. So there's an imbalance there. How important is work at the moment? Yeah, absolutely imbalance. You know, um, actually, maybe not. Maybe more important at the moment. And I wonder if that's the same for you guys. I think work feels like it's a 10 at the moment. And the extent to which it really matters is an 8. So I need to watch that one. Education and training. Yeah, I'm imbalanced there. Again, though, look at recreation and fun. I'm so out of balance there and ask myself that question. If I redress the balance and I put more effort into enjoying myself, finding fun, pleasure, laughter, would that help with the anxiety? Yes, for me it would. And I guess maybe it would for you guys. Spirituality, I'm absolutely in balance and that's important during this time. Citizenship, yep, yeah, pretty in balance there. Physical self-care though, no, I'm not looking after myself physically as much as I could. Because I said that was up as an eight. I reckon that's about a five at the moment. If I devoted more time to that, would that help with anxiety? And the slide doesn't show it, but the next one there was talking about social media. Am I in balance there? I'm way out of balance. Because social media, I said, was about a three in terms of how important it is. And for some reason, I am spending too much time on social media, looking at stuff that just makes me anxious. So this very simple exercise gives me some pointers. I forgot the dog. I'm absolutely in touch with the dog. So he was an 8.9, wasn't he? And um, he still gets that level of um, attention. So can you see that... The tool I shall send you asks you to sit and just be mindful because an absolute truism during difficult times is that if we can maintain our life balance as best as we possibly can, we can attend to that, meet it mindfully and where possible, just balance up our lives a little bit. What that does is it sustains us and it's the same as if we were running a marathon, you know. If we aren't sustaining ourselves, if we aren't fueling ourselves properly, we struggle. And we fuel ourselves psychologically and spiritually and emotionally by being in touch with the stuff that really matters. And I'm going to ask you guys just to think about that. And are there one or two changes that even amidst all of this, we could all be making? And we only make those changes if they're going to help you feel more balanced, a bit happier, less stressed. If they will, make those changes. So I'm going to share with you um, this process here, which I just call a model of effective living in high stress times. And if we just work our way around this this model, what we're looking for is psychological flexibility. And what that means is that we have the choice to choose how we respond going forward. Another one of the great Frankl sayings was between stimulus and response, there's a space. And it's in that space lies our freedom and our growth. You know, and if we haven't got that space, Listen to my language. We find ourselves. We don't choose. We find ourselves perhaps responding, reacting to stress and difficulty and anxiety in very unhelpful ways. 
So this model suggests that if we can spend more time gently bringing ourselves back into the present moment, then we're going to get through this difficult time a little bit easier. And later on, I will be sharing with you some techniques for how we use this technique called pivoting to make sure that we pivot ourselves back in to the present moment. We need to be willing to accept that, yes, these are difficult times, but no to aversion, indifference, and attachment. We need to be meeting, willing to meet this anxiety with wisdom, calm, and looking for choices, you know, and that's, that's being willing to accept that this is difficult without blotting it out or being angry and cross at what we're finding. We need to be very aware that during difficult times, our mind sometimes hijacks our common sense and we start reacting to very self critical, self deprecating thoughts about ourselves. We start finding fear and anxiety because we are listening to our thoughts and perhaps even fusing to them to a point where we almost believe that our thoughts are entirely accurate. They're mostly not when they're linked to anxiety. And we need really importantly to recognize that the only time that matters is now. And if we get pulled into our unhelpful self, which is usually based on kind of doubt and fear and um, old stuff, that version of me doesn't deal with stress at all because, you know, that's what we call perceived self. If we can gently pivot ourselves back and just say, no, right now, right now, I am okay. I'm tired. I'm stressed, but I'm okay. And it links in nicely, doesn't it, to that thought stuff. You know, find that sense of self that works for us. Because as the slide says, we are not our thoughts. We are not our feelings. We are not the images that our mind sends us. You know, I love this sense of, you know, um, a meditation we sometimes use, the clouds one, when we lie down in the garden and it's a lovely, bright, sunny day and we look up at the sky and suddenly a cloud kind of just blots out the sun and we spend our time kind of making it go away and being cross and angry with it. And then we suddenly realize that if we just sit with ourselves and wait, the cloud will move. It's that transcendent self, isn't it? That we're here, the stuff around us will change. And we need to take committed action, as we looked at earlier, to ensure that we're actually putting into place strategies, exercise strategies, looking at our sleep, making a committed effort, not sort of fingers crossed, I hope I get through this. There's no flexibility there making better choices, eating well, looking after ourselves, talking to our colleagues, being the best we can be. This is the stuff that just makes us cope and allows us to have the anxiety and take it with us, but in a, in, in a, in a manner that the anxiety doesn't overwhelm us. Because I'm not gonna come here today and say, Today's webinar is about getting rid of anxiety. That would just be ridiculous. We have to accept that during this period, anxiety is going to be part of our lives, but it doesn't have to be overwhelmingly blotting out everything else. And as long as we're in touch with what really matters to us and we maintain that focus, that focus acts as a huge buffer for the anxieties that are around. So I find this 
just this slide here to be my aid memoir at the moment, to just check in with this slide and check in, Mike, are you present? Are you trying not to have stuff all the time? Are you being bullied by your thoughts? Are you stuck in that Mike Scanlon that doesn't work at all for anybody? Are you living a life in touch with what matters? And are you actually Mike Scanlon, choosing to do the stuff that works, or are you mindlessly just plowing through this difficult time? So, a model of effective living, it's done it again, look. Let's have a quick look at thoughts, just to kind of peruse at this stuff. And let's do, um, apologize now, this slide I have done before if people are coming in again, but it is just such a peach of a, of a strategy for thoughts. Because I don't think, or at the moment, we've got time necessarily to be um, really sitting down and writing our thoughts down and being curious about them. And I think sometimes we need to just understand that thoughts are essentially words and pictures, and anxious thoughts are those same words and pictures that are polluted and bullied into our mind by that little tiny almond-shaped organ in our brain called our amygdala, our fear center. So I just want you to consider for a moment that you've finished work, you're driving home, and that dreaded phone shows up and you hear a beeping sound. And that beep is like Pavlov's dog, isn't it? And we find ourselves going to it, we switch it on, and the phone tells us in a text form that my account has been hacked and that at any moment, all the money in my bank account, in my savings, in my ISIS is going to be removed from my bank, unless the text tells me, with all of the appropriate logos on it, unless I very quickly text back to this number, including all of my security information. Imagine that's you for a moment. And how many of you, there's a hands up function on this. I think if you click on participants, you can see a hands up, that's quite fun to do. How many of you out there, immediately when you get that text, do exactly as you're told, and you slavishly go back and you say, right, oh my God, what is my safe, my, my oh yeah, I remember it now. And we text back our, our, our secure information to the bank. Now my guess is that you are all looking at me across the ether like I'm mad and say, well, of course we wouldn't, Mike. You know, not in a world of, you know, not at all. That's something I would I would never do. You know, let me just check on that one. Let me go all, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 and more no's. You just wouldn't do it, would you? However, your mind sends you a thought. And the thought is that you're going to make a terrible mistake tomorrow. And that terrible mistake is going to mean that your colleagues will be so angry and cross with you or your mind sends you a thought that there's no way you're going to get through this so you might as well not bother trying now earlier on when you got that text about your bank account every single one of you out there stopped you used your tacit knowledge you used your critical thinking skills you used your knowledge, your memory, your acumen, and you decided very quickly that, that this was just spam. But when we get an emotive thought linked to COVID-19, or linked to our survival, or linked to our standing in the eyes of others, or that's self-critical and nasty, we find ourselves believing it. My suggestion, guys, is stop. And I have the psychological flexibility to say, do you know what? I'm going to choose to check out whether this might well be a bit of brain spam. Because, boy, so many people that I'm working with at the moment are, you know, it's like brain spam city, Arizona. In it's coming, you know? If so quick. Yeah, spam. I think this is probably spam. I might check it out and speak to a colleague about it later, but I'm pretty sure it's spam. I'm not letting it push me around. Now, guys, that is a strategy that can really help us get through 
such, such difficult times. So essentially, right back to the Frankel stuff, isn't it? It's the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And there's so much of that at the moment, isn't it? But nonetheless, we fight at it, tire ourselves out, manic defense. And the courage to change the things I can, but the wisdom to know the difference. So we have to be accepting of that which we can't change. But you can change your thoughts. You can look at that slide I did earlier, and you can change whether you're in the present moment or way ahead of yourselves. You can change whether you're fighting not to have anxiety or willing to accept it. You can change the way you deal with thoughts. You can manage emotion better you can still live your life in touch with what really matters. Change what we can change. Stop trying to make things different that we can't. And remember that acceptance is not resignation. It's wisdom. So another strategy that I like, a real lovely mindful one, is to use this one here, which is RAIN. And this is going to lead me into the pivot process. So rain is where it's a really nice, because you just remember it, you know? And so if you're finding yourself really troubled tomorrow, feeling really anxious and on edge, you stop. You take one lovely mindful breath. And the breath I would recommend usually is hand on the tummy and a very gentle breath right into your tummy. Feel that balloon. Let it go. And then lean in. So do I recognize this thought? Yeah, old stuff. This feeling, yeah, not our. This emotion, oh gosh, yes, I recognize you. Make a bit of space for it. Okay, I'm not going to push you away. I'm going to allow some space for it. So why is this showing up at the moment? You know, why are these thoughts and feelings crowding me? Well, because it's a really difficult time, because I'm tired, because I'm not sleeping so well, because I need to be vigilant and on my toes. Okay. Now, when you non-attend, the secret of non-attending is you go back to what you were doing before the stress enveloped you. So if you were reading a book, you just go back to the book. If you were talking to someone, you go back to the conversation fully. And that's the point where we might actually try a pivot. Now, I've done two films to accompany tonight's session. Film one is showing us how to pivot when we find ourselves worrying about stuff that hasn't happened yet, making us more anxious, or worrying about things that happened earlier, making us more anxious. And pivot combines movement, physicality, with the process of coming back into that present moment. So if we find ourselves pivoted into worrying about stuff that hasn't happened yet, we kind of gently and deliberately take our head and we just pivot ourselves to there and we just check in and we lean in. Okay, how's it working for me at the moment then to be worrying about all this stuff that might happen, worrying about what could happen, worrying about stuff that could happen in the future. Check in with your breath and you'll find your breathing shallower. Check in with your heart, it's beating a bit quicker. Check in with your bodily tension. Oh my God, I'm tight. That's anxiety. And then we let go of that and we pivot back. And we say, okay, now what am I looking for? I'm looking for this present moment now. Right, I'm back in the present moment. So what's actually happening now? Yeah, it's stressful, but I'm managing. Yeah, it's uncomfortable, but I'm dealing with it. Yeah, I wish things were different, but they're not, and I'm doing the very best I can. And yes, this moment is tough, but the truth of life is this too shall pass. So we pivot, and we can pivot from a difficult thought, pivot, 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 pivot back into, okay, 
what would be a better thought to be thinking about this situation? So the pivot process just allows us to pivot from what isn't working back into what is working. And the two films I'm going to send you today, I think will take this and this learning of how to pivot to a new level that we haven't quite got the time for this evening. So I think it's so important that you guys do have time to ask and to ask questions. So I'm just going to finish with a final tool that I really think might be very, very useful. And that is the process of um, Mind Aikido, this is called. And there's a film of this as well that I've done for tonight. So I'm just going to walk us through this, but I'm going to advise you all tomorrow when SBK, the wonderful Vanessa and Paige send through the stuff, I'm just going to ask you, have a look at the unhooking film because it's really rather special, this process. And we use this Mind Aikido when we've got hooked psychologically, emotionally hooked by doubt, by injustice. And the one I'm coming across at the moment is a real kind of crossness and injustice about some of the stuff that is happening at the moment. Now, we're right to be cross. We're right to recognize injustice. But it's unhelpful to be hooked by it to the point where we can't sleep and we can't function. So the unhooking looks like this. I'm going through, I had it this morning, you know, um, I'm going through my day and I heard something on the television that made my blood boil. And this was in the morning before I went in for my NHS shift this morning. And I couldn't get it out of my brain. So I, I did some mind Aikido. So I stopped and I said, okay, God, why, why am I feeling so bad tempered and on edge and snappy? And what, what's this about? Oh God, it's that injustice, it's that anger at what that idiot on telly said this morning. Hmm, okay, Mike, you're hooked. So have I been hooked? And, and what's this hook? It's my old injustice hook, you know, and it, it, it just gets inside me and it makes me angry. How does it feel? I feel a bit trapped, I feel stuck with it. I feel a bit uncomfortable with it, you know? My mouth even feels dry. Mike Scanlon, what do you do normally when you get hooked by this kind of stuff? Well, you strop on all day, you go back and you think about it, you look at videos, you re-look at more telly than is good for you, and you, you, you don't function well. Okay, let go of all of that then, Mike. Now, the Mike Scanlon you want to be, that Mike Scanlon fella at his very best, what do you see him doing when he's hooked by something like this? And I go and look and I see him chuckling and I see him shaking his head and going, oh no, oh no, yeah, this is wrong, but you're not upsetting me today because there are bigger fish to fry and more important things to focus on. Oh my word, five senses. How would it be to be that Mike Scanlon? Brilliant. And now, finally, and what really matters to you, Mike, in your life? And I think about my wife, my kids, my dog, my life, my work, my friends, fun, my hopes, my challenges of life, the stuff that really matters. And in that moment when I connect again to values, that thing that's been making me feel anxious and stuck, it's now this big. It's still there, but it's this big. And we call that process mind unhooking, mind Aikido. Um, to be honest, in clinical practice, I just tend to call it unhooking. So that takes me towards the end. This final metaphor is just this. There are two trains waiting to take you on the holiday of your lifetime. One is a brand new, super spankingly brilliant train. And the other one is an East Midlands Spech. Smells of diesel, very uncomfortable looking. The guard says they're both cost the same. You can get on both train. One is going to be the ride of your life. The other one, well, it will just be normal trains. And immediately, we all find ourselves going for the plush, wonderful train. And as we're getting there, we turn to the guard and we say, can you tell me, when does this lovely train leave? And he says, it'll leave when, it, when, the, when the conditions are perfect. 
when it's the right time to make that change, when it's the right time to go, it, that's when this train will leave. It'll go soon, I think, but you know, soon, soon. When does the rubbishy old train leave? Oh, in two minutes. Which train do we catch? Because what I've done tonight is really important stuff. But if we don't make the change or a couple of changes now, today, within 24 hours, we will just carry on doing and dealing with stress the way we always have. And that ain't working at the moment. So maybe make the change. I hope I've left some time for questions. So um, if I just dive in and I'm happy to answer any questions that people have got. Yeah. Are there any ways to motivate myself? Because I'm just always tired. Do you know, I think that what I'd say that is we're probably always tired because of the effort it takes to try and deal with stress ineffectively. I think making a commitment to live better during these difficult times and to deal with this anxiety better just brings you back. Um, my job demands all of my time and my partner gets the rest of the energy. I don't know how to spend time on other things when I'm always stressed at work. Whew, I know, I do recognise that. What I'm going to suggest there is that your job feels like, and I think that might be a bit of spam, my job demands all of my time. No, have the flexibility and the kindness to self to start that sounds like the manic defense, you know, busy, busy, busy to be on top. See if we can do something about that. If the effort is higher than the importance, what can you do? So if the time, effort and headspace I'm giving to something is way higher, what I can do is I can look at it and I can say, well, now I'm mindful of the fact, because most of us are oblivious to that. We can actually then say, what could I be putting my time, effort and headspace into that will counterbalance, that will buffer the stuff that I'm putting too much time and effort? We only put more time and effort than equates to value if we are mindlessly, automatically in that churn place. Oh, Habib. How do we switch off and switch on? We don't. Trying to switch off from stress doesn't work, you know, and we don't switch on to it either. What That just doesn't work at all. What we've got to do is accept. Um, this is a really stressful time and it will ebb and it will flow. And we need to be mindful about when the ebb is there and when the flow is there and responding accordingly. Because to switch off from stress feels to me like you're pushing it under. What we can do is manage it, you know, dissipate it, diffuse it. Um, yeah, the presentations will all be, and there'll be the three films that will go with it as well. How do I recognize brain spam from legitimate thoughts? You meet it with curiosity. Um, you don't know straight away, that's the beauty of this spam approach, is you get spammed by a thought like I did this morning, which was, I saw somebody this morning and they went away and I swear they rolled her eyes and um, a thought came into her head is, you know, I think they, 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 they think I'm, I was useless. And um, I stopped and said, hang on, am I being spammed here? Because probably because they could have been rolling their eyes because they were thinking about going to Tesco at the end of the session. You know, maybe they didn't roll their eyes. Maybe they just kind of like had something in their eye. So I think I'm probably being spammed there. But I met the thought with curiosity. I didn't just slavishly do as I was told. I'm being very happy with, very, oh, sorry. I'm being very snappy with my colleagues when they offer suggestions. How can I reframe my thoughts to be kinder? I think that one there, maybe use the RAIN approach. Stop, you know, recognize. Oh, this isn't helping. Allow and make space, investigate this response with some curiosity, non-attend and pivot. So let's find this annoyed cross me. Okay, and now let's pivot back.
back, back, back. Right, is this the me I like? Yeah, how does this me respond to comics? Pivoting can be great. I feel it challenging to feel engaged with anything at the moment, almost like I'm outside of myself. Is there any way I can reconnect? I think, um, again, I'm gonna go for the rain approach, but I'm really gonna go for that slide on the flexible living, because we, if, you know, you say, I feel like I'm kind of um, unengaged with everything. That sounds like what we've gone into is automatic pilot. The answer is to come back and find, um, find that wonderful mindful space and to recognize that. Um, why is anxiety is always associated with emptiness? Because I think when we're anxious, it's like, think of the brain as a sponge. And what sometimes happens with anxiety, if we're not managing it, is we become so full of the anxiety that there is no room for anything else, you know? And so we feel empty. I dread going to work now. I never did before. What can I do to feel happier and not feel this way? Um, I think find that sense of dread, you know? And that sense of dread comes from being ahead of ourselves, doesn't it? Bring yourself back, pivot back into the present moment. Make every effort to live life in the now. Dreading is about dreading something that hasn't happened yet. And all that does is elevate our anxiety. Sounds like you really need to be really using the strategies we've we've discussed this stuff works you know and you can do it as we did with the two trains metaphor how do we incorporate the importance scale oh, where's that gone um oh there it is you discussed into a treatment session it's 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 a sort of side tool i tend to do it um at the beginning of treatment just to help someone recognize whether the life they're living is currently in touch with what really matters. I'll send through the handout that goes with it later because it, 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 I, I use that as a bit of a, a barometer for how I'm doing. I've got to tell you, a couple of years ago, um, my work was a 10 in terms of um, how important it was. And the time, effort and headspace was also a 10. But Mrs. Scanlon was a nine, the time, effort, and headspace she got was a two. But bringing mindfulness to that, I've been able to bring that and level that off a bit. I think she might even agree for once. How can you stop trying to get a balance in the different areas of life becoming a stressor in itself? Um, you don't attach to it, you hold it lightly. Here's a tip, tomorrow, when you're on the wards, imagine holding a cactus in your hand. You know, there it is. And using that cactus mindfully, this imaginary cactus, and go into work tomorrow holding everything carefully and appropriately and lovingly, but lightly. And if you recognize you're being you're stressed and you're charging and you're in the manic defense check in with your physicality what's happened to that cactus because if that cactus is being squished by your hand you're going to feel pain you're going to be reacting but you won't if you're holding it lightly so you can still have the stress but have the stress but respond to it lightly and sometimes the physicality of the, of, of the cactus metaphor can help us really through this one here. Um, Linda said, thanks for the webinar. The tools are really helpful. It's just to remember using this strategy. How does one do this? Um, watch the webinar again, I think. And when you get to that commitment phase, that slide I showed you about flexibility is my go-to at the moment. I just kind of once a day, pop in and have a look at it. Right, am I in the moment? Am I doing, am I? Right, Mike, you know where you're going, you know? Can be really, really helpful. I've chosen to socially isolate my friends. 
and it feels like your two trains metaphor. I'm anxious that I may choose the wrong train. Um, you won't choose the wrong train, you know, you really won't. If you recognize that there is no time like the present for choosing to do what takes you towards. Um, how do you deal with the guilt associated with not being able to do your job properly because you're too anxious? I think that's when we recognize that that thought that you had there is brain spam. You'll be, you'll be doing your job really well. You know, you really will, I'm sure of it. And you're being spammed that this anxiety is making you ineffective. And if you were kind to yourself, or if you used a simple CBT technique, like if a friend was having that thought, what would I say to them? But, you know, really, really, you're being spammed there. You know, nobody expects us in these difficult times to always be, you know, the great, wonderful person that never makes an error, never makes a mistake. We've got to be kinder to ourselves. Kindness to self reduces anxiety and we find a sense of perspective. There are lots of people saying how useful it's been, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, the title of Frankel's book, and why am I more irritated by people at the moment? Because you're stressed. Um, Frankel's book is um, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, he, he invented a therapy approach called logotherapy that's kind of a bit frowned upon in some ways now. But the sentiment, the book, and his, the way he got through the, 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 the Nazi death camps has so much to teach us about how we can get through COVID-19. It's never been more relevant, that book. And I'm kind of re-listening to it on YouTube at the, at the moment. Thank you, um, Rachel, it's been really useful. And um, I hope I wasn't uh, too much advice. Um, yeah, maybe I was. May I introduce a reminder, there's also staff wellbeing and counseling for, yep. Oh my goodness, thank you. Who was that? Oh, an anonymous attendee. Yeah, use everything you've got out there i'm kind of presuming you are anyway but use everything that you've got to your your your, your resources at the moment it's it's so so important uh, yeah how can i stop myself pushing others away um when i'm struggling is i think that's that again back to um checking in whether that's working for me does pushing people away work for me at any level or does it make me more stressed? You know, the workability of some of our actions and being mindful about them. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Okay, um, let me just go in. Um, ah, I meant advice on tools and reflection and checking in on self. It's important to do. Oh, uh, Rachel, you're absolutely right. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I started this crying and I now feel calm. Keep the calm. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Mike. Lastly, SBK Healthcare would like to say how grateful we are for your continued dedication and support. Thank you. Hi, everyone. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. Subscribe for latest content and make sure that the bell button is turned on so that you get a notification when we next upload.